Jesus doesn't require us to accept him. Uh, we have an element of free will in that. And, and the same thing is true when it comes to religious freedom. It's not the government's role to dictate to us how we are to interact with God. And in order to have religious freedom for one faith, we need to allow it for all faiths. Kristen, there's been a lot of talk recently about religious liberty. Uh, I've been running into and bumping up against this issue myself, and we want to talk more about it because I think it's becoming uh, mission critical that we understand our rights that lead to liberty in the United States, or we could actually lose them. So could we start by you explaining to us what does the term religious liberty mean in America today? It should mean the freedom to be able to speak and to live consistent with our convictions. It doesn't just apply to the Christian religion, it applies to other convictions, religious convictions and faiths as well, but it is about the limitation on government not to force us to do things and to say things mm. that violate our faith, which is our duty to God. So how has this definition of religious liberty shifted over the years? You know, for many years, most of our history, there was not a lot of case law. There weren't a lot of decisions or court conflicts over what that definition meant because the government kept to governing. And instead of passing laws that would infringe on religious liberty, they were focused on a more limited government. But as the courts started to dive into this, as legislators started to adopt more and more regulation that impacts issues that are critical to our families and our faith, we started seeing the conflict. And I think in that conflict, we also started to see some suggest that instead of the free exercise of religion, which is what's in the Constitution, we're seeing that be limited to sort of the free worship the ability to worship rather than exercise our faith in all the mm. different ways that God's called us to do so. And that's a very significant change that we need to resist. So there's a difference between saying, uh, you can worship God however you want to. You're in your living room and you can worship God and we're not gonna bother with that. But they're not saying that that's the same as being able to practice my faith in my workplace or apply my faith when I'm out in the public square. Precisely. And I think we're now even seeing, especially sort of once COVID started, um, the government has taken an even more aggressive approach to the worship aspect of it, as we saw how it That's was right. starting to shut down churches for extended periods of time while opening casinos and other, uh, you know, secular establishments. The government was trying to shut down the worship. We're also seeing it in terms of parenting and how it's playing out. Government officials are taking a more aggressive role in trying to limit parental authority. Uh, and that's a part of our free exercise of religion, too. You know, people from other countries, uh, originally from other countries, who now live in the United States, actually on my street, uh, are very familiar with this because they come from places where there is no religious liberty. They come here and they say, uh, my precious America, it's changing. Uh, you don't understand the value, the, the preciousness of what you have in all of these liberties. And you are beginning to come become like, in your country, what we are escaping from in our country. It's so important that we understand these rights. Now, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, this idea that uh, it was Christians who had an idea of liberty, both internal and external liberty, because they read the Bible. And they say, wow, the gospel sets me free from the power and the penalty of sin. But now with, with, with a liberated life, I can begin to liberate the institutions. Government does not have to be this oppressive monster anymore, but that it can be um, reflective of biblical principles, and so can the church. The church doesn't have to be this manipulation machine. It can actually express uh, the truth of God, and people can be free to worship and exercise their faith. However, Christianity may be the root of religious liberty, but the fruit of liberty extends to more than just Christians. Explain that to us. Well, I think that's a part of the gospel as well, Kirk. I mean, we see that Jesus doesn't require us to accept him. Uh, we have an element of free will in that. And, and the same thing is true when it comes to religious freedom. It's not the government's role to dictate to us how we are to interact with God. And in order to have religious freedom for one faith, we need to allow it for all faiths. Christians shouldn't be afraid of entering the public square, of entering the debate to be able to share our faith and to let the Holy Spirit 
at work in those moments. And uh, so religious freedom applies not just to the Christian, but to the Muslim, to the Sikh, um, and to all the different faiths. I think this conversation is so timely and I didn't have any idea that I would be bumping up against this very issue in my own life. Recently, uh, it's been in the news that I wrote a children's book that uh, champions biblical wisdom. It's a story about a little acorn that grows and becomes this great big massive oak tree and he, and he needs to learn wisdom through the, the different seasons. Like how do I get through the winter? How do I get through the autumn? And also produce the fruit of the spirit, like love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And I wanted to do a story story reading, a story time at a public library, but I was denied by over 50 woke libraries who had previously hosted drag queen story hours. And it was clear they just didn't want me there. And so I've been reading the Constitution, I've been reading the Declaration of Independence, and I let them know that um, if this is a misunderstanding, that's no problem. Uh, but if this is a case of discriminating against me because of my sincerely held faith, well then, there are protections in place that don't allow me to be discriminated against, and I'm prepared to see you in court, and we can talk about those constitutional protections. Uh, fortunately, they reversed course, and I went in there and read my story, and thousands of people came to listen. But I think that most of us going through life don't expect to be in that position here in America, and then when we are, many of us are not aware of the protections in place that we need to know so that we can uh, push open those doors that people close in our face. Talk to us about the protections that we have as Americans. Well, we do have the First Amendment. That's the first place to start. I mean, the founders weren't perfect by any means, but they set in place the guideposts and the protections that we need, both through the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution, to be able to ensure that we have the right, the freedom to speak and to live and to raise our children consistent with our beliefs. It's wrong for the government to discriminate against people because of the viewpoint that they hold. It's wrong when the government opens up, for example, a forum and decides that it's all on the same subject, but there's a particular view, a religious view that can't be presented in that. But I think you're bringing up an important point too, is there's a measure of courage and resources that need to be taken. We have to understand our rights, and then we have to be willing to assert those rights and push back. And when we do that, oftentimes it doesn't result in litigation, but it does result in the fruit of the gospel being shared and governments will back down when they sense that you know what your rights are, but they will press you on it. We see this especially in the public education system uh, where students, for example, when they don't press forward and saying, hey, wait, this is discrimination. I have the right to speak. But then when they do, the schools back down because they know what they're doing is wrong. And it sounds like that's similar to what your experience was. Yeah. Can these religious protections that are put in place actually hurt us if they are protecting really bad ideas in the public square. What happens when Marxists who are fundamentally opposed to the, the biblical foundations that give us freedom use these protections to advance ideas that will erode our very republic? We engage. The way to pursue truth is to speak truth, and the way to persuade is to enter the marketplace. We can't have free speech if we don't give free speech to everyone. And again, we shouldn't be afraid to engage and to speak the truth in all of these settings. In addition to the First Amendment protections, there are protections involving the right to associate. There are state protections that are in place. There are non-discrimination laws that also protect us. So again, I, yes, there are concerns. We've seen concerns about what's being taught in the public education system or how are bad ideas entering. But the best way to correct bad ideas is to put forth good ideas. And if mm. we try to use the government power to silence ideas that we oppose, then that means the government has the power to silence our own ideas. And that's far more dangerous. It's actually totalitarian. And we know what the results will be. And that in the end, we won't be able to share ideas and help people see the light and understand the truth. Kristen, let me ask you about the 303 Creative versus Ellenis case. You appeared before the Supreme Court arguing that case. What, what can you tell us about it? 
Well, it was a busy month. We argued the case at the United States Supreme Court on December 5th, and I had the privilege of arguing the case. 303 Creative is a website and graphic design business, and it's owned by Lori Smith in Colorado. Lori wants to be able to design things that are close to her heart. She's a believer. She wants to be able to promote um, ideas that, again, enter the marketplace and speak truth, including the truth of marriage and to show the beauty of God's design for marriage. But Colorado took the position that if she wanted to create custom wedding websites that would share God's design for marriage through a particular wedding or couple announcing that wedding, she would have to do the same thing for same-sex weddings and that she would face significant penalties and repercussions if she didn't. That case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, as I said, and we argued it on December 5th. In some sense, it's a follow-up on the Masterpiece Cake Shop case that was argued five years ago as well, but that was decided on the free exercise of religion grounds. This case will be looking at free speech. How do you think that it will go based on the previous cases and uh, the, the, the judges in the Supreme Court? I'm very hopeful. I've been in this long enough to know that if you try to predict exactly what the court will do, you'll get, get it wrong. But the oral argument was very lengthy. Hours and hours went longer than expected. The court asked great questions. And based on the questions that were asked, I do believe the court understands that it needs to protect Lori's speech and that by doing so, it protects the speech of all Americans because her decisions are based on what the message is that she's being asked to create, not who the person is that is requesting it. And that's a critical distinction for the First Amendment.